I'm McAllister, I'm a faculty member of the Department of Film Production and Media Studies, which is in the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications. And I'm also the chair of the coordination committee of this event. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's Robert M. Pachris uh, Memorial Lecture. Uh, Dr. Pachris was a member of the Penn State Journalism faculty from 1948 to 1977. His teaching specialties were radio news writing, public opinion, and popular culture, and he valued global and international perspectives in his teaching and his work. He's probably best known for his dedicated to students, both students who were both while they were here and then when they left Penn State as alum. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is to honor Dr. Pockers' memory and his many contributions to the former School of Journalism, now Department of Journalism, and College of Communications. This lecture series was endowed through a series of gifts contributed in his honor, especially from Judith Harless, who was a 1952 Penn State graduate. Uh, in addition to being a big supporter of our college, she also has established the Harvest Endowed Fund to provide financial assistance to outstanding undergraduates majoring in women's gender and sexuality studies, WGSS, who demonstrate a strong interest in reproductive rights, health access, and in policy making related to women's health. So on behalf of the Pacras Coordination Committee, which, is, which uh, encompasses Homero Gildi Zuninga, Jessica Myrick, and Mary Beth Oliver, all three of them, in fact, are title professors, so it's a pretty uh, esteemed group. Uh, we'd also like to thank a few folks for making the Pacras lectureship possible, including our um, dean, very Novelso College Dean, Marie Harden, um, department Head of Film Production and Media Studies, Matt Jordan, um, the Belisario Activities and Special Events Coordinator, Shannon Brace, and the Belisario Director of Strategic Communications, Steve Sand. Right uh, now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Heather Schoenberger, an Associate Professor in the Department of Advertising and Public Relations. She will then introduce this year's popular speaker. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming out uh, this evening or late afternoon. Uh, so I had to have notes because that can be so accomplished that even just recording a little bit of highlights, I uh, couldn't remember everything. So here we go. Uh, Dr. Daly is a associate professor in the Department of Media Production, Management, and Technology at the University of Florida, where she studies information, communication, and technology with a view towards influencing law and policy. Her research focuses on privacy, online media, and communities. Dr. McNeely is also a senior fellow in tech policy with the Mozilla Foundation and a faculty associate at the Berkman Clyde Center for Internet and Society. Uh, she's published many research and law journal uh, articles, including an article that appeared in Computers and Human Behavior, a Harvard Kennedy Misinformation Review. Some specific topics she's examined, including doxing, uh, include doxing, misinformation, spam, the right to be forgotten and the legal concept of indecency. Uh, she holds a PhD in NASCOM with an emphasis in media law and a JD from the University of Florida, and a Bachelor of Science degree in both journalism and Afro-American studies from the University of Wisconsin. Um, tonight, the title of her talk, and you can see behind me on the very cool slide, is Sound Off, Data Persuasion Regulation. And it is with my great honor uh, that we get to welcome Dr. Jasmine McNeely, um, who's not only a special scholar, but a dear friend. So, oh, thank you very much. Sorry, so Dr. Schoenberg, Steve, and D. My personal high school. Hopefully, she only charged me group on prices because uh, she's really good. So, the title of uh, my talk is Sound Off Data Persuasion and Regulation. But first, let me thank the there is Belisario College of Communication for the opportunity to give this uh, talk to you. It's about a topic that I'm interested in. How about that? It is a topic that I think is not happening in a vacuum. It affects all of us, and there are implications for how we continue to live, to work, to do so many different things. And I hope from this, if you take one thing, is to think about sound, sounds, Sonic data as a part of a larger ecosystem. And that ecosystem includes all of those innovations that people are telling you is really cool, but there are 
significant impacts from those innovations. And that's what I'm concerned with. I'm concerned about like how we adopt things and those things we know have issues um, with justice, with fairness, with equity, and just getting things wrong. And what do we do when things are wrong? Do we continue to use the things, to adopt the things, to create with it, or do we press that pause button? Um, and, and what are the implications of that as well? So sound off. Talking about sound. I make this statement. It's not a shocking statement to you, right? We make noise. We as humans make noise. We make noise collectively. We make noise individually. I'm making noise right now talking to you, and you recognize it. You recognize a voice as noise. It is sound. It is um, something that your brain takes in, it translates, and you understand what's going on. It's not just my voice that is sound, um, right? There's sound when people use fireworks. There's sound when people honk their horns at you. There's sound when people press their brakes really quickly and mash them and their tires screech or their car makes that lurch sound. But we also make noise that human ears cannot perceive. We make traces, we leave traces, we make exhaust perhaps from our bodies. Just by standing up here, sitting out there, you are making noise that only the machine can hear. Only a machine can hear, I should probably say. You have your own unique biorhythm. You have your own unique heartbeat. And most people say, so what? But what if I told you that researchers have said that with well over a 95% accuracy, they can identify you from the way your body makes that noise that we humans can't hear. Huge level of accuracy from something that we can't hear, we can't necessarily define, and we can't really change. But it can identify you. And so you say, Jeff, and so what? It can identify you. That could be good, right? So what if somebody's missing? What if somebody's in a coma? And we can use that biorhythm to identify them because you know they're in a vulnerable state. They can't identify themselves. Maybe their family has no idea that they're around. OK. What are the other implications of being identified when you don't necessarily want to be identified? Or you don't want to be given an identity for you that you have not chosen for yourself. We make noise. Sometimes that noise we can't hear, but something can hear, and not just hear, but can collect that. Sound? does not happen, again, in a vacuum. But this data can then be connected and aggregated with other pieces of data about us. That means that there can be inferences made about us, predictions about who we are, who we'll turn out to be, all from noise. Noise, sounds. What I'm talking about is sonic data. So how I define science data is this. It's those representations or observations that define the characteristics of sound. These are cognitive and emotive forces. So what does this mean? It means that these are those characteristics that have uh, both, uh, that, that tell us how we should think about something, but also evoke emotions in us. So I get this phrase, cognitive and emotive function from, I mean, if you take it media law yet, so you may have had this case, Cohen versus California. And Cohen versus California, it's 1971, it goes up to the US Supreme Court um, because this guy got arrested in 1968, it takes a little while to get to the Supreme Court. He got arrested and convicted of violating a municipal statute. And the municipal statute said, uh, if there's any offensive conduct that happens in a like state or municipal building, you could get arrested, you could get fined for it. So he got arrested and he was convicted and sentenced to 30 days in jail because he wore a jacket. It was 1968. What's happening then? 
Vietnam, war in Vietnam. People are pissed off, people are tired. He wore a jacket that said, F the draft. This was scandal. So he got jacked in the municipal building, got arrested, since the third day. The question is, wait a minute, what does the First Amendment say about being convicted of an offense that is really not about conduct, but is about the subject matter of what was on his jacket? And the US Supreme Court said that we're, we're communication which is what the jacket was, and the message was, is protected, not just because it is communication, but because it has these two characteristics. It has cognitive, it's sending a message, but also it evokes emotion. And even if those emotions are bad, even if you're offended by them, guess what? The First Amendment says, too bad. We're gonna protect it. So this is not a First Amendment lecture at all, but this is really important, right? Sour. And in that case, he was silent. He didn't make a noise at all, at least a noise that we can hear. But his jacket spoke volumes and obviously evoked all kinds of thoughts and emotions, at least for the police officers that arrested him at that time. Cognitive and emotive forces of communication of sound, the transference of ideas. At least the, the possibility of the transference of ideas, all different kinds. This is what I'm talking about with sonic data, right? And sound is a part of our ecology as humans. It is a part of the patina of how we live. And we don't even pay attention to some, certain sounds, right? There was coughing just a second ago as part of the patina of winter in the north of the United States, the south of the United States, too, quite frankly. There was, perhaps there'll be a sneeze later. Perhaps as you're walking down college, you'll hear the cars, you'll hear the buses. As you're walking through campus, you'll hear the people on those scooters, right? You'll hear that fuzzy sound. Sound is a part of us as we function and move through life. But sound has consequences, or at least how sound is processed it has, is consequential, and more is consequential for certain uh, places and certain groups of people. I point to this um, article that came out a few uh, months ago, but even lately there's been other reporting on this technology and this technology organization called ShotSpotter. If you don't know what ShotSpotter is, it is an organization has said that through sensors, they can tell police where a shooting has happened by collecting sound. Now here's the thing, how many, you think about this for a second, how many different things sound or can sound like a gunshot? There's a lot of different things that can sound like a gunshot. Uh, any of you play fire, fireworks? Yeah, fireworks. Any of you had a car that's ever backfired? Like shot. But ShotSpotter has other um, issues besides not working as advertised. And that is that it is, in almost all of the municipalities that have adopted it, it is a processing tool that's only used to listen in certain neighborhoods or predominantly in certain neighborhoods. So here we have sound or sonic data being used as a tool for labeling. For labeling certain neighborhoods and therefore certain groups as certain things. What are the ramifications, think about this, what are the ramifications for you, your parents, whoever else, as homeowners, as people who just live in certain neighborhoods, as people who need to get car insurance, and having a label on you based on data that you have nothing to do with. All sound data, whether it's erroneous or not, but there are labels attached to it. Certain groups of sensors, predominantly in certain zip codes, mean certain things. They are used to make inferences and predictions. 
In this case, uh, Minneapolis schools were secretly partnering with Child's Father, but only in schools that were predominantly black or Hispanic. What is the label then we're putting on these students? What are the long-term implications of that for them? Larger part of the ecology, how we live, what is affecting us, all the many different factors that data, some included, could possibly impact us in the short and long term. Sound, part of the ecology. So what are the lessons perhaps we can look at for making sense of what's happening with sound, sonic data? To think about this, I looked at a lot of cases in the United States in particular uh, that dealt with wiretapping and hidden recordings. Because that's basically what we're talking about. We're talking about sound being recorded, being taken, being aggregated without permission and without, many times, without people knowing about it. So I use these cases to help us like, think about what should be happening and how we should uh, think about what to do with all of this sound data, this recordings, these ways that organizations and individuals are using the sounds that we make. One of those lessons is his, right? There is a clear distinction between active information collection and passive encounters, right? Again, if you're walking down the street, you may hear somebody talking loudly through their AirPods. You may hear people arguing. You may hear people laughing. Those are brief encounters you have because you are a human and you engage with other people. But what happens when these are not passive encounters anymore? but that the conversation that you overhear becomes a integral part of a larger pool of data to be processed, to be aggregated, to be crunched. It's like, imagine this, there's this, there's this uh, we're on a campus here, right? So probably there's folks here that do this. There is a uh, area of study called bioacoustics. And bioacoustics is kind of old, it's older than me, it's kind of old, and it is usually used where Conservationists, environmentalists, they set out sensors, sound sensors, to collect uh, sound data in forests, in swamps, and other places because they want to identify the animals that live in those areas. And certain animals have certain distinct sounds that they make, right? And so it's cool for them because what if they hear something that they long thought was extinct, right? Did they have evidence? That that thing is not really extinct, but that it's there. I hear the sound of the cougar. I hear whatever, right? But what if we use bioacoustics for humans, right? I hear the sound of this emotion, fear, anger. I hear the sound of a particular kind of cough. That cough sounds familiar. It sounds like TB. It sounds like pneumonia or the common cold. I hear the sound of, again, throwing it back to shot fire, I hear the sound of uh, what sounds like a bullet or a, a gunshot. All of those things from which we can make predictions about people. And the question is, do we want organizations and even governments to be making those kinds of judgments and predictions about us? But more importantly, what about the active information collection that's happening? We are organizations actively seeking this data, this really rich data. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. In New York, around 2018, 2019, uh, the city of New York started changing its old uh, phone booths to Wi-Fi center, Wi-Fi hubs, the Lincoln Y system. And it was supposed to be, if you're walking on the street, you'd be able to connect to this system, and it'd be really cool because you'd be able to you know, use, not use your data plan or whatever. But if you look at their privacy policy, there was a phrase in their privacy policy that was kind of interesting to me. Because I looked at their privacy policy, 
And that privacy policy says, we collect ambient sound. And I thought, what does that actually mean? Because they don't explain things like usually a organization fails to explain what it means by what it's doing in its privacy policy. But it meant that any sound that could be heard by that Wi-Fi hotspot was going to be part of this data pool. We collect ambient data. We are always actively collecting this data for processing. And here's the thing. That data was not owned then by the government of the city of New York. It was owned by the Lincoln Y third party vendor for which the city of New York would have to ask them to use that data for public purposes. But Lincoln Y could use it for whatever purposes that it wanted to, barring a contract with the city of New York. You can imagine the many different ways that that data could be used, uh, some possibly good, but many of them just for commercial purposes to make money. There's a difference between active information collection collection and passive encounters. Another lesson of sound law is publicness of data. How public it is, how publicly available, influences judicial recognition of a reasonable expectation of privacy. So look, if you're going to take media law, know this for your privacy chapter. You have the lowest expectation of privacy when you're in public. You have the greatest expectation of privacy in your own home. That's how we parse the law in the United States. This is the tradition. What do we do, though, when there's so much that is public? We live publicly. We walk outside. We talk on the phone. We, uh, our hearts don't stop beating when we walk outside of our, our homes, our doors. What do we do when what was public, our voices, our footsteps, becomes way more than those things that we can hear. But just because we're out in the public, those other sounds are now public as well. That means the machine can hear you even if you can't hear yourself. Publicness of information. And so a, a great um, theory that has been promoted is that we need to stop with that dichotomy between in your home and versus in the public. It doesn't help anyone. There's gradations to how we communicate with each other, how we have to interact with, with the rest of society that makes this public, no privacy, in your house, privacy, stupid. Publicness of information and how public that is uh, you know, influences judicial recognition of privacy. In the United States, I want to make that clear. And finally, a, a third lesson from sound law is this. Advances in technology heighten the implications of data collection. Again, I've been talking about sonic data, and I've been talking about that, that sound that we can't hear it um, ourselves, but that machines can hear. But also, I, I want to add to this that it's not just hearing one time. It is a continued listening for sound, for you know, footfalls, for heartbeats, for electromagnetic signature. Continue over and over and over again, collecting this data from various places. And here's the thing. Again, a part of that ecology, it's not just we, we collect this sound and we let it sit, so to speak. We collect this sound and we try to connect it to all the other pieces of data that we have, whether that's zip code, whether that's area code, whether that's IP address, whether that's um, the store you walk past. All that allows for greater inferences, or more, uh, at least we think, more correct inferences about who you are, the affinities you have, what you might like. All for things like, how can I better sell you something? 
and get you interested in uh, things. These are lessons from sound law. And so from these lessons, I've promoted this idea of hearing versus listening. And that is, hearing something can be okay. It's a passive encounter, or at least it should be. But listening, active, active data collection, active data processing, actively seeking to find out about you is not okay. And it needs to be regulated. There needs to be a way for us to say, I don't want to participate in a larger ecology, ecology of data collection and data aggregation and data processing. In the alternative, there needs to be a way for us to turn it off. Hearing versus listening. But so up to this point, I've been talking about static data as emanating from us. And it's very important. But I also want to talk about how sound and sonic data from other sources impacts us, because I think that's just as important, especially from the, the um, perspective of organizations, and not just corporate organizations for that matter, but organizations attempting to persuade us in certain ways. I think for folks who are in like advertising, marketing, uh, PR, you may have heard about some of these, but it's good to, I think, dig into what these could possibly mean for what we think of is or should be sonic or sound privacy or autonomy with connection to sonic data. So here's a, uh, <laughs> this is a, a graph, or a, yeah, let's call it a graph, that I made in connection to this research I did with a recommender system. It was an audio recommender system. And that audio recommendation system really wants to know how does it how does it get more people to trust it, trust the recommendations that it produces? How does it get more people to trust it as a platform? Um, and they wanted to compare it with all the other social networks, social media, and other apps that people use all the time. And so what I did was a lot of qualitative research, both interviewing uh, folks and having focus groups to see like, what is the deal? Do you trust this platform or not? And what I found is this, that when data was sensitive, they had high trust in financial apps, so banking apps and uh, other money-related apps. Right? Why? Because there is law about how banks have to behave, how financial institutions have to behave. If they're not protection, protecting personal data, guess what? The government will shut it down. It's not the same thing as with a auto recommendation system or Facebook or TikTok or uh, it was Twitter back then, too. But there was still high trust or um, like high data sensitivity, but they had very low trust in those social media systems. But look at where audio recommendation systems are. There was high, relatively high trust in those recommender systems, even though they said they thought that the data involved was not as sensitive. In fact, one of the uh, responses I got to a question about like, why are you okay with giving a sound platform your personal data. And the person said, well, I don't care if people know what kind of music I listen to. It's not that big of a deal. Right? I think that stems from not understanding that people can, people and organizations can make inferences about you by the kind of music and entertainment that you engage with. In fact, there was a law passed in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, because of a person, Robert Bork, who was up for judicial nomination. And uh, Bork, who's still around, I think, uh, the journalists, were, they were trying to find out more about them. That's what journalists do, try to find out more. But you know what they did? They went to the video store. I know 
which our video store is for. But imagine if Netflix had a actual brick and mortar store, and they kept a record of all the things that you watched or rented. And the journalist got a copy of that. And most of it was like just benign, kind of whack uh, movies that he watched. But from that, the journalist was able, like, people could make all kinds of conclusions about you and your taste related to what you watch, what you engage with. This is why the libraries, our libraries in the United States, are really strict about uh, letting people know what other people have checked out. Why? Because that is really personal data. Even if it's just books, even if it's just CDs, right? It has really personal data, and predictions can be made about people. I'll give you another example. Uh, and a few years ago, Facebook got in trouble for allowing advertisers and marketers to segment people by race and gender and by political affiliation. And so they, you know, made um, agreements with the government, and they were going to change. But if you look at it, you can still segment people by race, but the race um, tag, not tag, but the race mechanism is different. Instead of like a straight up race, black, white, Asian, Native American, you can put in things like affinities as proxies, meaning, okay, I want to segment, I want to target Asian people. So what do Asian people like according to Facebook? Uh, Asian people like K-pop is one of those things that they found that has a way to target Asian people. Another way is um, let's target Middle America, a certain segment of Middle America. What do Middle Americans like? WWE wrestling, right? So affinities, things that you watch, things that you read, things that you um, check out can be used to make, again, inferences about you, predictions about you, to sell you stuff. Sound is the same way. Sound is another way, another vector of allowing the sale of something. Just to, just to hammer this home, Ad Week, about two years ago, put out this story. It said sound is going to be a critical part of the metaverse success. Now, whether or not the metaverse will exist or is a successful kind of place is one thing. But I think the idea behind it is really important. And their idea was that sounds allow for the recognition of your brand. People will connect the sounds, not just jingles, right? Not just the McDonald's five, blah, 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 not just that, but other kinds of sonic sounds, the sounds that you hear when you walk into a store, they will connect it online and you're making a experience for them and they'll be more likely to connect with that and to buy to stay there, which is attention, which is valuable as well, and for you to be able to collect data, more data about them. Sound is super important to sonic branding and brands and making things work for people who want to persuade you to do something. Now that seems pretty benign. Advertisers want to sell you something. That's not, I'm not giving you information. But what about when that thing is not so good for you? What about when the actor is a bad actor? These are important questions to think about. Let me give you an example of a bad actor. New York Times and other organizations have been reporting about what's called voice cloning or voice deep fakes. That is the use of um, natural language processing and LLMs or generative artificial intelligence to clone a real person's voice to make it sound like that person and then to use it for many times bad things right sometimes it's okay things so there was a the use of uh, a deep fake voice deep fake for david Beckham, where he appeared in a ad and made it look like he spoke nine different languages david Beckham doesn't speak nine different languages at all but the ad made it look like he did. But in a negative sense, voice quoting is being used to call people and try to get financial information, tell them that 
you know, the bank, you know, somebody tried to get into your bank account, can you verify your banking information? There was another story a couple of weeks ago where a family was called and told that their kid had been kidnapped. And so it was kind of like the kid screaming on the phone and then the kidnappers get on the phone and say, send money here or else. The kid had not been kidnapped, the kid was fine. But the use of this generative technology, sound, evoke emotion to get people to engage in certain behavior. Sound can impact us. Sound as a part of greater ecology can impact us. And finally, our fan favorite TikTok, right? Um, TikTok is a multimedia platform, but it's a sound platform, right? Sound is a lot of what drives what happens on TikTok. The lack of sound can make or break whether or not you get up on the For You page or whether or not people click like. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, UMG said TikTok, you can no longer use our copyrighted material. And so that was kind of bad, kind of bad on the artist side, right, for UMG Arts, because they're not um, a part of that economy anymore, but also bad for creators who depended on these certain sounds to get their messages across. But also, Wired did a deep dive and noted that music is important, but what's even going to be more important are just sounds in general. Sounds used to persuade people, sounds used to buttress any of, the method, any of the methods or messages that are being displayed on TikTok, sound being used to spread conspiracies or conspiracy theories. If any of you have been watching um, or paying attention to what's happening related to Kate Middleton, big conspiracy about where she is, but sound, attached sound to that, it also adds another layer of expression and messaging when talking about these conspiracy conspiracy theories. I would also say look at the sounds that are connected to many of the messages or um, uh, TikToks related to flat earth and the tunnels under the earth as well. They use similar sounds, right? So that goes to their credibility. They're putting an in-group um, messengers that are putting for certain kinds of content. So what's next for regulation? My thought is this, and that is we'll have to start looking at sound as a dark pattern. If you're not familiar, a dark pattern is a way of designing something, but it's a message, a page, a pop-up, a notice that gets people to do something that they ordinarily wouldn't do, but for this pattern. It's, it's a way to either evoke distress, to bypass cognitive or um, danger notifications that we would know. It's a way to get people to give up something of value. Sound can ultimately be used to do that within these contexts that I was talking about. The good thing is that our government in the United States is working on regulating dark patterns. We'll just need to include sound or sonic data as a part of that huge ecosystem again of deception and unfairness when we think about how and why to regulate these kinds of things and these kinds of issues. And with that, I'm going to say thank you. For questions, everybody has questions for Dr. McKinley. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts about um, deep fake and AI, AI using voices in like a, a comedic setting? And I've seen a lot of things with um, 
famous people, former presidents, Joe Rogan, um, and, and in, in a comedic sense, and where do you draw the line between how we cross the line is this defaming them, ruining their reputation versus can we enjoy it as a comedy? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that there's been a lot of, um, prior to this, even with other technologies, and quite frankly, without technology, just like things like uh, lookalikes and soundalikes, we have some deep policy or public policy related to that. And the idea is if it is uh, satire or parody, we give grace to those things. We give grace to that in copyright law. We give grace to that in even privacy and appropriation law. We give grace that we allow people to have commentary, even if that commentary is funny or poking fun, we allow that. The problem is sometimes it crosses the line from commentary, like the satire or parody, into deception, right? Deceiving people into thinking certain things about other people. It'll be a fine line to walk, but I think there's some like clear distinction. It could be funny to a certain group, but still have a purpose of deceiving. And that'll be really important for us to think about. But I think we give grace to charity and satire, while at the same time looking at the intent of the thing as well. You're my life, but <laughs> Hi, thank you for that provocative sonic treat of a talk. <laughs> and um, and I'm thinking too, this kind of there's a connection to what um, the gentleman who just spoke uh, asked about, um, kind of pushing pushing boundaries or or whatnot, but. Um, you talked about hearing versus listening, yes. and that listening should be regulated because it's an active process. And it made me think, um, well, when corporations find themselves regulated because of listening, they're going to start doing things that seem more or are hearing. And then we might get more concerned about hearing. And, and the connection to the humor is well, you know, when Alex Stein was here, and by the way, he was here in a room in the BJC last. Not at the BJC, quite different. In a small, small conference room to a very small, small audience. But the, there's this movement happening among like neo-fascists and hate groups to pass their work and organizing and violence against people uh, off as humor. And to try to seek protection and do kind of a, a, a reverse Cohen, if you will, right? Where their action is perceived as speech and they can hide behind humor. So, I don't know, there's a lot in there. I wonder if you've seen any attempts of listening, trying to pass off as hearing. What what should we be concerned about hearing? And just some of your thoughts. Yeah, so I think we should be concerned about any, any time an organization, and that's all organizations, whether it's government, corporate, or non profit organizations, anytime there's that many like that. Any concern, period. That's that's my thought process. Um, and as far as the hearing versus listening, I think we have to note that sound is everywhere, and people make sound. What they don't necessarily want is that for that sound to be a part of a greater system in which they become impacted by that. And that's what I mean by hearing. Hearing allows for Basically, that people are going to make sound, but it's pass. It's a, it's a passive thing. It happens. It's ephemeral versus the same power of listening, where it's being processed. Now, do I think that hearing um, will become a problem? It can because it's still the data. It's that body still. Um, and what should we do about it? Possibly. I, in the United States, and for those of you who don't know, we don't have a federal omnibus privacy or data protection law. We don't. We, we needed it 20 years ago. Hopefully we pass something really, really soon and it's actually comprehensive and it doesn't allow carve-outs for different kinds of things. In fact, it should be so strong as to say, uh, 
uh, no data collection unless, right? <coughs> That's just not a problem. Whether that, that happens, I'm not sure. Thank you. Uh, one other thing I wondered about in a similar, very similar vein uh, is there are lots of smart technologies yes. which, which listen to us all the time. Yeah. And there have been some famous cases with Alexa and whether they give up the data and murder cases and other things. But all our phones are listening and more and more devices are listening now. Yes. And so when you're talking wiretapping and, and all of this, you want to make a convention, but I'm wondering if you have any comments about is it just following through on this notion of we need this regulation you were just speaking of relative to all of the devices around us that are, are, are listening. I know, for example, that certain companies, you can get a discounted phone rate if you're willing to let your phone be a microphone to listen to everything as you go by, yeah. which of course means then if I'm walking by someone who has one of those, even though I haven't made that agreement, I'm now party to that. Yeah. So especially with the body type sounds you're talking about that are modeled. So any extending this and sort of all the other technologies that you gestured at, there's some really practical ones that we have around us that are already starting to cause problems. Yeah. So I think there is a some technologies need to be their own. Like they don't need to be as they don't need to be like why does your TV need to collect sound data? I mean it's one thing if you are actively using the voice command or control. And there are reasons that we allow that and we want to have that for especially for accessibility. Uh, you know, people who have disabilities and we want them to be able to actively use uh, different technology as well. But to have it on as a default, to not even ask whether they should be collecting data, that's the problem, right? And then to make it a part of, like, uh, the larger pool of data for the organization is is part of the problem. So I think um, smartness needs to be regulated. Um, is public education about what we're giving away also a component there? I mean, I so in general, I think people need to have like critical data literacy. But here's the thing: there's a power imbalance happening. So I can be as smart as I want to be about data and data collection, and guess what? It doesn't protect me from the organization continuing to to like that. So I don't put the onus on us as individuals. I'm saying governments, hey, what are you here for Congress? Do something. Uh, uh, thank you. And I just uh, noticed that you have pictures that says the uh, uh, people's trust in social media and finance applies and so on. So I just want to ask that what you think about the shopping applies uh, as, as well level? Because I think uh, some uh, showing implies work like people's voice on um, because when I first use Amazon's, uh, it just recommends some computers or cameras. But uh, I talked with my friends. I said I think uh, some some jackets or the uh, clothes are good in Amazon's, but I did not search it, yeah. and 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 I realized that uh, the next day when I opened the Amazon's uh, and the jackets or Close uh, many times of them on my homepage. So yeah, I just want to... yeah. And you know what? Organizations will say, and some some policymakers will say, no, they're not listening to you. But there is just yes, they are. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think again, what we have is data being collected without your permission and used for what to get something of value from them that you otherwise may not have given to them, but for this technique, this data collection technique, I think that needs to be regulated. Now, there's some people who argue that that targeting doesn't actually work, but obviously it does. There's an impact that happens. There's an impression that happens related to the advertisement, the marketing of a certain good. Even if it's a negative thing, that thing will be in your mind. And that's to some strategic communications or communicators, that's, that's the thing. It's left an impression on you. And so, as far as the regulation of that, totally needs to be regulated. Right now, um, we are, we have kind of the Wild West. I think the Federal Trade Commission in the United States is trying to do many different things. Um, they need a larger budget to potentially tackle all the things that are happening. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, is there also a benefit to like the consumer getting a personalized like marketplace? Because I feel like if that was taken away, I'd probably have a harder time navigating social media or shopping centers just because I make like I personally feel comfortable with when I communicate things around me that they show up just because I am now getting that in my direction instead of having to search out. So would like would it be better if there was an option of people people be able to select whether they would like to participate in that and not? Yeah, so opt-in versus opt-out. I think having opt-in be something that people choose can be okay. And I would but I would I would hesitate to say that all things should be all opt-ins should be allowable. I think that what we are seeing now is that are the consequences of opting in or not being able to opt out are way longer or way long term or those negative uh, implications don't necessarily appear immediately related to the kinds of data that we give away. Um, so would I say personalization personalization is okay? Sure, you opt into it, but I I would caution that even opting into a personalized marketplace, that we don't know all of the long-term effects of giving that away. And um, that, let me give you an example. And this is not just a silent example. We know, there's been studies, that um, even something as what we think of as insignificant as your zip code can have huge long-term effects on how you are viewed, what people and organizations think about you, and how they relate to you. And that can have long-term effects on things like getting a loan, it can have effects on health care and the ability to get health insurance. And those things, while they seem kind of benign, you can say, well, we'll just go to a different provider or a different loan um, organization. That has long-term effects on your participation and your life, how you live or can live. And that also downstream effects on people that you're connected to, whether you're children, so if you're not able to get a loan for a house in a certain neighborhood, your quality of life does go down, can go down. That also means your, your children may not go to as good schools as you want them to. This is all, these, all, these are things that all affect life and quality of life. I wish it wasn't like that. It shouldn't be like that. But this, this is the consequences of using data to label, to personalize even, but to also process and make predictions about people. Who's a good risk? Who's not? Who's, who's deserving of a job or admissions or whatever? All based on points of data aggregated through systems like I'm talking about now. And these systems, uh, have longer term impacts than perhaps what we perceive automatically. So it seems that um, you're calling for regulation of data collection, data use, and data sale. Should that regulation come from the Federal Communication Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, or some other entity? Um, it seems that our Congress if it has uh, a primary value, it's um, free enterprise and selling things. And so who is fit to make these regulations? So uh, the FTC and the FCC, that's not in their purview, either of them. Uh, the FTC can attempt to protect consumers based on what's happening, but it's up to Congress to pass the law and to enable the FTC or some other agency to enforce that law. But it has to, it has to be Congress. 
for it to work. And it was, uh, yeah. Even the people in the Congress we have. Good. Uh, thanks, it's really, it makes me think uh, quite a bit. A um, couple things. A lot of the sound ordinance law is based on kind of unwanted sound intruding into people so that the right to be left alone is sure. basic. Big role, you're talking about inaudible sounds, which kind of complicates things uh, to a certain degree. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, from the other side of things, from the surveillance angle, you're talking about, about uh, um, unwanted surveillance, but also unknown surveillance. So I'm just wondering if you could tell me who, who like, what's the card out that allows people to collect this stuff without a search warrant? Because the right to be left alone. It, you know, also protects people from when wants to surveil, so to show a warrant, all these things before you can do that. So how, how are corporations able to do stuff as non-governmental organizations that uh, the government could not do without following kind of evidentiary in the front? Yeah, so the law, I mean, so uh, the Constitution and requirements for warrants, so under the Fourth Amendment, only applies to the government. Corporations are not bound by that. At all. Corporations, um, if unless there's a specific like uh, private right built into a statute at the state level, um, then corporations are kind of free unless there's an other kind of law that prohibits them from behaving in certain ways. There's nothing stopping an organization from engaging in certain kinds of behavior. Um, we can't say. Uh, right to be let alone, because that's it's not really a thing. Um, for <laughs> it's, it's not really a thing. Um, there are privacy laws and privacy kind of laws, but there's not a law that says corporations or organizations or anybody you can't behave in certain ways with respect to this. There are bank laws that are privacy laws or considered privacy laws. There are like mail. And wire fraud laws. The wire tap law is for everyone, for anyone engaged in recording. But we know that the federal law is a one party law. That means only one person needs to know that there's recording happening. That means that person could be the, the person recording. I know, oh well, if you don't know that this is being recorded. So, uh, there's no, uh, there's nothing actively discouraging necessarily a lot of what's happening with that collection of sound, but for maybe public opinion and maybe state law, depending on how state laws are. But you couldn't use the data, I'm also interested in what the evidentiary status of data would be like, something that you can't see or present in front of a jury. You know, it's like the void comp test uh, and, and, and the blade runner, like right? only the machine can tell. Yeah. Like, what's the evidence like this if the company collected something? Would it only be a problem if they tried to use it in criminal proceedings against them? Uh, no, not that not that I'm aware of. There, there's evidentiary opinions about like chain and authenticity and those kind of things, but um, someone mentioned it earlier about the like Alexa Siri voice. Those have been allowed in court. Like those recordings coming directly from Amazon or Google have been allowed and used in court. But uh, and and those were being recorded without at least one of the parties knowing perhaps that Alexa or Siri was in the room in the room with them. Yeah. That's a great question though. Since we're on the topic of the Constitution, and since, as you said, the Bill of Rights portrays to like the federal government, yes. would you say if the federal government were to like enact a law that goes against like dark patterns and to restrict people through like manipulation, would you say is that a violation of the First Amendment? Or, as since we're kind of on that topic. Uh, so depending on how it would be written, <laughs> uh, depending on what it says, it could be, someone could argue that it would be a, 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 a law focused on expression. It could, possibly, depending on how that law is written. 
be on its face a violation of the Constitution? Possibly. Again, it all will depend on the text and what is being targeted um, by that law. I can't give you a definitive answer, sorry. But also, I just want to correct something. The, the Bill of Rights applies also to the states through the 14th Amendment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe one more question, and of course, this can be continued later. Uh, thanks for the great, great talk. I actually, and since since Matt said the last question, I, I have a few, but I'll, I can't decide which one to pick. So I'll ask them all, and you can choose which one you want to answer. Um, one thing that I'm curious about is how, you know, obviously a lot of these technologies, we, we can think of examples where the surveillance is used in some positive sense or in some negative sense, right? So to the extent that Google is able to figure out where there's an outbreak of the flu based on people's search engine searches, that can be useful for the government to, to do its resources. But to the extent that there might have been audio surveillance on the ellipse on January 6th, if it had picked up, oh, there's a giant crowd moving towards the Capitol, theoretically the police could have been more prepared. On the other hand, if it's a nonviolent protest, you're worried about the civil rights of those who are being surveilled. So I'm wondering, as I think about London, which has, um, my understanding is, more cameras than anywhere else and have been in place for decades now, how, what do you think their response would be to the question of does having that level of surveillance, does the, do the benefits outweigh the harm? So do you think people in London would say we're able to, to prosecute more criminals and deal with things in the city and that that outweighs the fact that we've all given up much more of our privacy and the police can follow us from home to work in the bar and everywhere else we go. I would say they would say that. Um, I would say though that privacy is also cultural. Um, how we perceive of privacy, how we perceive of things that touch privacy, like or conflict with privacy, like free, free expression, like many other things that conflict with privacy, is different than how the UK and the EU countries conceive of those things and the importance placed on them. I also would say that when you have a population that has been um, socialized with surveillance, that that makes a, a large difference as well. Um, if we use it from an American context, the socialization of Gen, Gen Z and Gen Alpha with social media, with parents putting their, their kids on social media, has meant that people have grown up with screens on them, right? But that doesn't mean necessarily that those people don't still have expectations regarding how people may use those recordings of them. And so while I think that a place like London or the UK would have a very different reaction than we would in the United States, I think it's important to think about, again, one of the things that is really important to me, long-term effects of that. And also, uh, the layering of technology. So it's not just the CCTV, we're making recordings, but now CCTV is layered with facial recognition technology. We know that facial recognition technology has problems with errors, especially for uh, skin that is darker and people who look more feminine. So are we going to continue to use a technology that we know has problems just because we are socialized to allow that undergirding technology to happen? I don't know. I don't think, I don't think that's a smart, smart move by long term. But uh, I think, yes, there would be a very different, there is a very different reaction. But I still think people in the UK respect a certain level of privacy, even if it's not with law enforcement. In that sense, maybe with corporate. And then one final observation talking about um, dark patterns yes. and whether or not regulating dark patterns could have First Amendment implications. 
And, and to me, it's a really fascinating question. And there are certainly some design features in software and apps that one could argue are manipulative and, and across the line into being deceptive or unfair. On the other hand, there are others. I mean, it's interesting that within both our college and communication arts and sciences and liberal arts, right, there are people who have, for centuries, have studied persuasion yeah. and how do we influence people. Yeah. So to the extent that you know, the grocery store plays a certain kind of use app to encourage us to linger and shop more, or that a restaurant decides to paint their colors, their walls a certain shade of red, because they studies suggest people will order more food. Right. Those are, I mean, it seems to me that those are both in one sense potentially, I mean, they're, it's purposely intending to persuade and manipulate, but that one could argue there's a, First Amendment freedom to choose what color I want to paint my walls or what music I want to play in my store. Right. Yeah. So here's the thing about why, in our First Amendment jurisprudence that protects advertising communications, that advertising, while it still gets First Amendment protection, it gets a lower level than social or political speech. And that is, if you regulate advertising, advertisers won't be upset as much because they'll just think of a different way to sell you something, right? So they, you may have cut off one or less than one way of reaching people, but it's not going to stop an advertiser or marketer from attempting to use a different way to get to people. That's, they are considered, uh, what's the word, a hardy, right? Regulate them and then just come back with something else, something new, and that would be it. It doesn't stop their channels of communication or attempting to persuade you. But with data, though, it can draw out a certain business model, or if you stop allowing them. So, and that's why I think it would be uh, certainly the argument that this is a first thing that you should do. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Peter. Thank you for being here. Have a nice day. Thank you so much.